Thank you, Dr. Oviedo, for your kind introduction. And I'd like to also thank the organizing committee for AAMP teaching rounds uh, for inviting me, first of all, and giving me the opportunity to present the very first session. Um, today, we will talk about diffuse gliomas uh, and the diagnostic approach based on their main molecular alterations, as well as the surrogate immunostochemical stains that we use for diagnosis and classification. Uh, I have no disclosures. Since 2016, we have the impact now updates that are regularly provided by a group of experts, and the idea was to provide uh, first of all, clarification about some of the 2016 uh, changes, as well as provide additional updates as they come out rather than waiting for the new WHO. And as the, their name suggested, they were not official WHO, but um, majority of the changes suggested will be incorporated in the upcoming 2021 classification. And in today's talk, I will try to capture everything that C Impact now has recommended, as well as all the upcoming changes in WHO, as uh, far as I'm aware. So what do we do for workup of diffuse gliomas? Most important thing I would say is we cannot look at the pathology in an isolated uh, pathology and without paying attention to the patient's age or the location of the tumor or the imaging findings. There is too much information that we cannot um, really ignore. And once we have the tumor in our hands, when we have the h &E slides, the first thing to do is to confirm that we are indeed dealing with a diffuse glioma rather than a circumscribed glioma or a different group of tumor altogether. I this class um, what do we do at UDF if you ask? So we start with all diffuse gliomas in adult setting. We uh, approach, our approach starts with four immunostochemical stains, including one for IDH1, R122H, mutation specific protein. And going forward, I may refer to this as simply as IDH1. Uh, ATRX stain, looking, we are looking for loss of ATRX staining, uh, which, with, which will be associated with ATRX molecular alterations. We do P53 stain and KI67 uh, proliferation marker for almost all tumors. And in addition, depending on the location and age, we have surrogate markers we identify histone 3 mutation. Occasionally, we need additional tests that we cannot cover with surrogate immunostochemical markers, and we try to uh, choose appropriate molecular tests, but um, that, that which molecular test you choose will depend upon what before 2016, the moment we decide something is a diffuse glioma, the next um, th thing in the list was to decide if you are dealing with an oligodendroglioma or an astrocytoma. And uh, with 2016 classification, uh, we used to have an oligoastrocytoma mixed category, but with 2016 classification, that's really no longer an option because we know majority of those tumors can be either classified as oligodendroglioma or astrocytoma based on their molecular alterations. And with 2016, the important change was actually the introduction of the integrated diagnosis. So having the morphologic features uh, are no longer sufficient for diagnosis, and we may need to do some molecular tests to reach to an integrated diagnosis. And the most important of those molecular alterations, I would say, is the presence of IDH or absence of IDH mutation, especially for adult diffuse gliomas. So if we have a tumor that is a diffuse glioma and it has an IDH mutation, then we expect the tumor have one of the two accompanying uh, molecular pathways. Um, and the first one that I will discuss is the presence of 1P9 co-deletion in these tumors. Most of these tumors also have histologic features of and tumor has an IDH mutation and a 1P19Q co-deletion, 
he can diagnose this tumor as an oligodendroglioma and use the existing grading criteria with increased mitotic activity, microvascular proliferation, and necrosis, and diagnose this as either oligodendroglioma grade two or anaplastic oligodendroglioma grade three. So I'll just uh, show a brief case example um, to this. Dr. Pekmaji, sorry to interrupt. Your audio is cutting in and out. If you would, wouldn't mind going off video, that might help a little bit. Right. Hmm. Let me know if it worked out. Uh, she being showed that it had right frontoparietal low vision with mass effects that is T2 flare hyper intense, and there was no contrast enhancement. Um, she underwent a biopsy, and biopsy showed that there is a diffusely infiltrating glioma. You can appreciate the neuropil in the background with the entrapped axons, and it is hypercellular than what we expect for this location. And when we look at hypercellularity comes from these atypical cells that have naked nuclei, no cytoplasm, regular nuclear borders with dark chromatin. When we look at, uh, look at the tumor cells even more closely, we can see the irregular nuclear borders here, like this one. But in other areas, some tumor cells show more round nuclei and fine chromatin. And I picked this case on purpose because I didn't want the morphology to be perfect for one diagnosis or the other. And I wanted to show how we need to work these out. Um, and this tumor may have been called an oligoastrocytoma before 2016 because it had some round cells and bland morphology, but it also included irregular cells with irregular nuclei suggestive of an astrocytoma. Plus, it is actually lacking the more common features that we think of in oligodendroglioma, including capillary um, branching capillaries that we refer to as chicken wire capillaries, as well as the perinuclear halos, fried egg appearance. So we worked this up using our uh, immunosechemical stains. The tumor cells are strongly positive with IDH1, R132H mutant protein, and ATRX staining is retained, suggestive of a wild type ATRX gene. P53 showed scattered positive cells, um, not so strongly staining in many of the cells. And um, this is at best in a, a, a wild type P53. And KI67 proliferation index is low. So we now have an adult um, patient with a hemispheric uh, tumor location, and there is no enhancement in this case. So of a low grade uh, radiologic feature. And our histology is consistent with low grade, so everything else fits. We have an IDH mutation, and immunostochemical stains argue against an ATRX and TP53 mutations. Now, the next thing to do is to look for 1P19Q codeletion. And you can do so using various techniques, including FISH, RACGH, NGS, methylation, whichever is available. They all have their advantages and disadvantages with slightly different sensitivity and specificity profiles. Uh, but you can choose whatever is the most available option. And then if this is present, this tumor will be called oligodendroglioma. Here, I just want to show you an example of a fluorescence in situ hybridization test. As you can see here, these um, two red dots correspond to the centromeric uh, probes for chromosome 1, and these two green dots correspond to the centromeres of chromosome 19. And as you can see, for the 19Q and 1P, there is only one probe suggested that the other uh, chromosome arm is completely lost. So with these uh, together, rumpy 19 q codeletion confirms the diagnosis of oligodendroglioma, uh, IDH mutant rumpy 19 q codeleted. Going back to our diagram, if you have an IDH mutant tumor and it is not rumpy, So this is important because sometimes we may have morphologic features that remind us oligodendroglioma, but unless we show the 1P19Q codeletion, that tumor is an astrocytoma. 
So this was actually one of the first questions immediately popped up after 2016 classification came out. The question was, do we need to do IDH, uh, 1P19Q co-deletion testing for all IDH mutant tumors? The answer is no. So this is the C-IMPACT NOW update. And it is based on the fact that these tumors have frequent molecular alterations in addition to IDH mutation, namely ATRX and TP53. Uh, and between the two, more than 90% of astrocytomas that are IDH mutant will have one of these uh, alterations or more likely both of them. And we have surrogate immunosechemical stains to look for ATRX and TP53, and we can use those to diagnose that you necessarily need to do 1P19Q co-deletion testing. So once we reach out to astrocytoma, we use the existing histologic grading and grade this tumor accordingly. I will put a pin here for now, and I will come back to grading of IDH mutant tumors at the end of the talk. So let's look at another case. So our second case is from a 34 year old man who presented with visual field defects and imaging showed that he had a left temporal lobe mass involving the insula and the lateral geniculate. Uh, that is T2 flare hyper intense and there was no enhancement uh, on contrast imaging. He underwent resection and now we can see the tumor again. We can see this fluffy cotton candy like material in the background, consistent with NERPIL, and it is increased cellularity. And when we look closely, the tumor cells are uh, largely bland around the nuclei, uh, but there is nevertheless slight variation in nuclear size. And I say this is one of the most important features that. Uh, the, the tumors have variable morphology, even though the all nuclei may look kind of round, they are still not as monomorphic as we expect. And uh, there is increased um, um, hypochromasia in these tumor cells. In addition, there were other areas in the tumor that looked even more pleomorphic with really irregular nuclear, nuclear borders and hypochromasia. And there were no mitotic figures that we can find. We could not find any necrosis or microvascular proliferation. When we do our regular um, routine four stains, tumor had a positive staining with IDH mutant protein. And as you can see here, the tumor cells also lost expression of ATRX uh, um, protein while you have the normal internal positive content. So this argues for an ATR. In addition, they're in 53 suggestive of a T gene. We located in this case suggestive of a low grade histology which fits uh, with the histology we have that's a low grade histology. And with the presence of IDH, ATRX, and P53 alterations in this tumor, uh, we can diagnose this now as a diffuse astrocytoma, IDH mutant WHO grade 2 using the grading criteria we have so far. So going back to this, I would like to discuss another case that fits in about the same area. So third case is a 37-year-old man who was diagnosed with a low-grade Uh, his glioma was insufficient, and because of the location, he only underwent biopsy followed by um, temodar and radi radiation therapy. And now, 18 months later, he presented with increased size of his tumor with expansile um, T2 flare in hyperintensity and heterogeneous contrast enhancement, which may be tumor itself or which may be a little bit of a radiation effect. This time he underwent resection of his tumor. And as you can see, this is more significantly hypercellular as opposed to the other two tumors we reviewed. There is significant variation. And there is a mitotic figure that we can hopefully appreciate even at low power already. And again, the tumor cells have variable morphology with irregular nuclear borders, some, some more uh, oval, some are more polygonal, and we have mitotic figures. We still did not find microvascular proliferation or necrosis in this case. So our
antibodies staining in the tumor cells, and you can see the positive internal control. P53 showed diffuse staining in tumor cells, suggestive of a TP53 mutation, and KI6 uh, we estimated around 12%. Are we ready to call this tumor an anaplastic astrocytoma based on the presence of mitosis? We would have called not so fast. Um, so we, we are dealing with a tumor that uh, seemed to be IDH negative, but have to pay attention that ATRX was lost, suggestive of an ATRX mutation, and P53 was diffusely positive, suggestive of a TP53 mutation. And these two often seen in association with an IDH mutant tumor. And this IDH mutation recognizes only this partition, and it doesn't catch the other IDH1 mutations or IDH2 mutations. And so now it's time to do IDH1 or 2 sequencing, and you can either use Sanger sequencing, looking for the um, hotspot mutations in the exon 5, or you can do a larger panel targeted sequencing. And in this case at UCSF, we often go for uh, NGS rather than Sanger sequencing. And if you can show the presence of IDH mutation, this tumor would be called IDH mutant. In this case, though, I wanted to show an example of what Sanger sequencing looks like. As you can see here, we are in the same codon 132, but in this case, instead of an arginine to histidine, we have an arginine to guanine um, mutation, but it nevertheless qualifies for IDH mutation. With that, this tumor now will be called anaplastic astrocytoma IDH mutant WHO grade three. I'd like to put a pin in this case, and I will get back to this case in a few minutes when I actually discuss the um, proposed changes in 2021 classification with this, um, grading of the IDH mutant tumors. So now let's move on to the IDH wild type tumors. By definition, a diffuse glioma that is IDH wild type is an astrocytoma. And after this point, we can still use the same grading criteria and any tumor that has microvascular proliferation or necrosis will be called grade four glioblastoma. And this is actually the most uh, common tumor in the uh, adult patients with diffuse gliomas. And previous studies showed even predating 2016 classification showed uh, that these tumors have frequent molecular alteration. Group that frequent alterations are usually multiple, but the one And I'll we'll see in a minute why, that these tumors often have third promoter mutations, EG amplifications, and chromosomal changes, including polysomy 7 and monosomy 10. And let's look at an example of the most common tumor that we potentially will use. So this is a 62-year-old man who presented with seizures, and imaging showed that he had a left insular uh, mass that was T2 flare hyperintense, and you can see a ring enhancement after contrast. Imaging uh, in histology, we appreciated a diffusely infiltrating glioma, and even at this power, you can recognize that the tumor cells are really pleomorphic. Some of them have very symmetric really show is the grading criteria of microvascular proliferation and necrosis. As you can see here, there's palisading necrosis, meaning the tumor cells are lining uh, as a fence around the necrotic area, as well as microvascular proliferation, meaning that there is uh, endothelial cells piled up on top of each other. You don't really appreciate a lumen, but you have a, um, um, multiple endothelial cells making a glomeruloid-like mass. If we do immunohistochemical stains, we can appreciate the tumor cell. Uh, in, in, in this case, I don't, I'm not showing you, but the IDH R132H was negative and tumor was positive, uh, retained its ATRX expression and strongly positive with P53. So in this case, we are tumor in an older adult. The tumor is located at the hemispheres and show enhancement suggestive of a high grade tumor and what we have on histology fits with a high-grade tumor. Tumor cells are negative with IDH. And with this, we can diagnose this tumor as glioblastoma, likely IDH wild type WHO grade four. 
And in this tumor, like I said, we expected promoter mutations, EGFR amplifications, polysomy 7, monosomy 10, among other alterations. The other thing to consider is that we need to do an MGMT promoter methylation testing for all glioblastomas. And it's because um, those tumors with MGMT promoter methylation tend to respond to alkylating agent chemotherapy, such as Temodar, a lot better. Uh, I hopefully you all noticed that I call this tumor likely IDH wild type. And the reason for that is we tested the IDH status of this tumor using only an immunostochemical stain and we didn't do an IDH one or two sequencing. So the question is, should we do 1P uh, IDH one and two sequencing on this case? So previous studies show that in older adults and the cutoff they came up with was 54 in older adults with no prior history of a low-grade glioma and, and tumor cells are intact with ATRX, the likelihood of an alternate IDH mutation is less than 1%. So for cost-benefit analysis that you don't really have to do IDH sequencing, but um, there is definitely a group of patients that you may be uh, misclassifying if you use only immunostochemistry. All right, going back to our table, uh, now we are dealing with the IDH wild type astrocytomas, but they do not have microvascular proliferation or necrosis. Therefore, they are classified as diffuse astrocytoma or anaplastic astrocytoma IDH wild type. So this is a um, special group because it is actually a provisional entity in 2016 classification. Certainly, what is absent in the tumor, not what is present in the tumor. And unfortunately, it's a mixed bag of tumors. Um, significant, multiple studies show that a significant subset of these tumors actually behave very aggressively. This is the um, red line here that are IDH wild type astrocytomas who do not have the morphologic criteria for a glioblastoma, yet their survival curve looks very similar to the IDH wild type glioblastoma. And this is another study from UCSF group. These, um, this teal uh, line represents the IDH wild type astrocytomas that are grade two or three using the histologic criteria, but their survival curve is somewhere in between IDH wild type glioblastoma and IDH mutant glioblastoma. And also, of course, the question is what are the molecular alterations in these tumors correlate with, uh, with the worst clinical outcomes? And multiple studies show that third promoter mutation is one of them. So these two bottom lines correspond to tumors that are IDH wild type. And as you can see, there's a big survival difference between the tumors with third promoter mutations and without. And this was including only grade two and three tumors. It didn't have morphologic grade four tumors in this uh, figure. Similarly, other groups show that third promoter mutations were associated with poor prognosis, as well as EGFR amplification was associated with poor prognosis. And finally, the other criteria that multiple groups show that the tumors with uh, monosomy 10 and polysomy 7, this red line here, had a poor uh, prognosis, the survival curve more similar to glioblastoma rather than a grade 2 and 3 tumor. So with this, we have the C-IMPACT NOW update 3 referring to these changes. And the changes that we know that we commonly see in uh, IDH wild type glioblastoma can also be used as grading criteria and we can associate them with a molecular grade. And C-IMPACT now suggested that any tumor, any diffusedly infiltrating astrocytoma with one of these molecular alterations can be called glioblastoma WHO grade four. Uh, actually, they didn't use the term glioblastoma. They said astrocytic glioma with molecular features of glioblastoma, WHO grade four, but for simplicity's sake, uh, I think 2021 will um, group these as glioblastomas. And finally, the tumors that have neither of these uh, mutations can still be called anaplastic or diffuse astrocytoma IDH wild type. Let's look at an example. So we have a 57-year-old uh, woman who presented with new onset seizures and imaging showed that she had a, a T2 flare hyperintense mass in the left insula extending towards the basal ganglia with a little bit of a contrast enhancement, very fine contrast enhancement in this location. 
because of the location, she underwent stereotactic biopsy and all we had is uh, two pieces, each about this size. And when we look closely, we can see the crisscrossing white matter bundles and it, there's slight hypercellularity. But the first thing is, are we even dealing with a tumor? That's what really the first impression of this image was on me. But when you look at high power, you can appreciate tumor cells that have really irregular nuclear borders and hyperchromatic nucleus consistent with egg uh, glioma. And we only have a few atypical uh, glial cell irregular nuclear borders that you If you do chemical stain, tumor cell to fit IDH, they have retained ATRX expression, and P53 shows only a few small. Okay, I67 highlights the atypical cells, and it's actually a useful thing to do if you are dealing with a low um, number of tumor cells. It can actually highlight these cells with irregular nuclei, confirming your diagnosis in a way. So we have an adult patient hemispheric tumor that's enhancing, suggestive of a high-grade tumor, but histology is low-grade. So this is one of the red flags. And even though we, and we don't have any of these alterations that we often associate it with low-grade tumors, such as IDH, ATRX, or P53 mutations. So are we ready to diagnose this tumor as diffuse astrocytoma, IDH wild type, WHO grade 2? I don't think so. Hopefully not. And actually, at UCSF, we call these tumors at the time often diffuse asterisk glioma, likely IDH wild type C comments, because next step we will do molecular testing to look for the molecular alterations I just listed here. So any tumor with one of these alterations uh, will be called glioblastoma, WHO grade four. And we can do this by next generation sequencing or single uh, gene testing using Sanger sequencing for TERT and fluorescence in situ hybridization for others if you want. Uh, but once you need to test more than one um, molecular alteration, it seems to be more cost efficient and would definitely more, saves more tissue to do targeted next generation sequencing. And this is the result of UCSF 500. You can see the integrated genomic weaver showing the uh, one of the hotspot mutations in third promoter gene. And this is the close up of the copy number plot. As you can see here, there is a high level amplification corresponding to the EGFR gene involving in chromosome seven. So with this, this tumor had third promoter mutation and EGFR as well as a couple other alterations. And with this, the diagnosis is glioblastoma IDH wild type WHO grade four. Going back to our table, uh, now, I think it's time that we go back to these IDH mutant astrocytomas and discuss what we know about the grading. So one of the first questions that came up is, do, does the existing grading criteria uh, even work for IDH mutant astrocytomas? Because the grading criteria predates the IDH mutation, anything we know about the IDH mutation, we, don't, we weren't sure uh, once you separate the IDH mutant tumors out, they would stick. And multiple studies show that actually they didn't. And during the search, or maybe instigated by the search, uh, we started looking at other molecular alterations that may help us degrade IDH mutant tumors more properly. And one of the uh, things that we found is tumors with CDKN2A homozygous deletion had a poor prognosis as opposed to tumors with no CDKN2A homozygous deletion. But um, C-IMPACT now updates, summarize all the existing uh, literature on this, and they show that presence of homozygous deletion was actually uh, correlate with a grade four IDH mutant um, tumor. And one thing they recommended is, yes, presence of a CDKN to a homozygous deletion should qualify a tumor as grade four, but maybe we shouldn't call them glioblastoma anymore. We should call them astrocytoma IDH mutant grade four with a Arabic numeral grade four to separate this out from more significantly poorly prognostic diagnosis of um, glioblastoma itself. And this is one of the other changes that's going to come in 2021 classification that we will use Arabic numerals instead of Roman numerals. And the most important reason is so that uh, there is less chance of misreading Roman numerals. As you can see here, it's easy enough to actually mix a two or three, or there could be more typographical errors. Uh, but with changing the name and 
almost like getting rid of glioblastoma, now we need this extra safeguard to read grades uh, properly in IDH mutant tumors. All right, going back to our case um, of the 37 year old with recurrent glioma, we found the tumor had an IDH1 R132 G mutation and the tumor had ATRX loss and P53 staining suggestive of ATRX and P53 mutations. And when we do sequencing, we found in addition to those expected changes, we found the tumor has a CDKN to a homozygous solution. In addition to multiple other changes in the copy number plot here, hopefully you can see the deep deletion uh, corresponding to the CDKN to A to B gene here. So with this, the diagnosis for this tumor now is actually an astrocytoma IDH mutant WHO grade four. So the next question is, when should we test for CDKN to a homozygous deletion to exclude a grade four tumor? There is no um, firm recommendation about whether we should be testing all IDH mutant tumors or some of the IDH mutant tumors, but it's important to test, definitely test at least a subset. And um, we can approach this in a similar way we approach the IDH wild type tumors. So if imaging suggests a high grade tumor, but all we have is a low grade on histology, especially on a tumor with a, uh, just a biopsy, I think it's a uh, important thing to do to actually catch the um, undersampled tumors. In addition, uh, if you have increased mitotic activity or KI67 to raise suspicion for a high-grade tumor, it's a good idea to test for CDKN to a homozygous deletion. And if there is any other clinical concern for a high-grade tumor or progression to a high-grade, it's a good idea to test. But um, I think more studies needs to be done to see what the cost effectiveness of, uh, cost effectiveness of doing CDKN to a testing and it may come down to that we should test all tumors, um, but um, there is no such recommendation yet. All right, going back to our tumor um, diagram one more time, we still have a little bit of a problem with these anaplastic, especially anaplastic astrocytoma IDH wild type and glioblastoma IDH wild type, as the names still refer to what is absent in the tumor, not what is present in the tumor. And whenever we have one of those, uh, especially when the morphology is not garden variety glioblastoma, or if you have a lower grade tumor that you think is a diffuse glioma, it's important to pause for a second and double check. Did we consider everything that we should in the diagnosis? Are there any other things that we should be considering or, or ruling out? And the main two group uh, in this is actually pediatric type gliomas, especially in younger adults. And if you noticed, I said pediatric type, so it's not necessarily a pediatric age group I'm referring to, but a group of gliomas that are more commonly associated with pediatric age group and non-infiltrative gliomas, especially in the setting of a low-grade glioma. So I think it's a good uh, time that we can go and discuss some of the pediatric uh, approach to pediatric type tumors. So if you um, are dealing with a diffuse glioma, especially true for a pediatric age group, but the, also the, uh, true for young adults as well as any age in the midline tumors, the first thing to consider is the location. What kind of, uh, what is the location of your tumor? And if you have a tumor in the midline, the next important thing is to test for the histone three lysine 27 status of that tumor. And if the tumor has an H3K27M mutation, it is by definition a diffuse midline glioma, H3K27M altered, and it's by definition WHO grade four. This is again, one of the first updates that came from C impact group right after 2016 classification, clarifying the diagnostic criteria that's all in the name. You have to have a diffusely infiltrating astrocytoma. It needs to be in the midline location and it needs to harbor an H3K27 um, uh, mutation. And with that, regardless of the histologic grade, we can call this tumor WHO grade four. And this is an example of what I am talking about. So the, the patient, 72 year old man presented with altered mantle status, and he had uh, imaging, he had multiple T2 flare hyperintense lesions, mainly located in the uh, basal ganglia and thalamus. 
and there were no contrast enhancement with these lesions. He underwent a biopsy, which showed diffusely infiltrating glioma, as you can see the nerve pill in the background, and you can see entrapped neurons here. And there's increased cellularity, and you can appreciate the tumor cells with irregular nuclear borders and hyperchromasia, and some of them are more pleomorphic like this one than the others, confirming the diagnosis of a diffuse glioma. When we do our routine set of stains, IDH is negative, ATRX is retained. P53 shows essentially very weak few uh, staining in few salts, arguing against the TP53 mutation. Ki67 is elevated, we estimate this one around 8%. Important thing is to test for the presence of H3K27M mutation, and we have a mutation-specific antibody, and as you can see here, it's strongly positive in tumor cells here. The other correlate of this alteration is this mutation actually prevents the normal trimethylation of lysine 27 in this location, and presence of mutation is associated with loss of the trimethylated H3K27M, as you can see the tumor nuclei are negative. So with this, um, we can diagnose a diffuse midline glioma. So for any age, it's important to remember if you are dealing with a midline tumor, regardless of the histology, we need to do testing for histone uh, 3 K27M mutations. And these tumors actually may have ATRX mutation and P53 mutation accompanying the histone 3 mutation. So presence doesn't presence of ATRX or P53 doesn't exclude the possibility. And with this, we can diagnose a diffuse midline glioma H3K27 altered WHO grade 4. So this was the first arm. In the non-midline locations, in the hemispheric locations, the next important question is what is the age group? So this is especially important, obviously, if we are dealing with a pediatric glioma. And it is because infant type gliomas are significantly different than uh, gliomas in the children and in adolescents. And most of the gliomas in, um, in this category, if, it's, if they are seen in an adult, they would be in young adults and they would be similar to the more uh, adolescent tumors. But so why are they different? So studies show that infilt infiltrating gliomas in infants often have alterations involving the NTRAC, ROS, MET, or ALK genes, and they are often associated with a fusion. And these should be a separate group of tumors. And in upcoming 2021 classification, they will be a different group of tumors uh, named as infantile high-grade glioma H3 um, wild type. But if we have a... Um, non-infantile tumor, either a young adult or child or adolescent, the next important question is whether the tumor has an H3G34 mutation or not. Those with H3G34 mutations often harbor an ATRX and P53 mutations accompanying the histone mutation, and these will be called diffuse hemispheric glioma H3G34 mutant going forward in 2021 classification. Let's look at an example. So this is a 27-year-old woman who presented with a right frontal lobe mass. And as you can see in this diffusion-weighted images, um, there is the tumor is crossing the corpus callosum to the other side, and there's increased cellularity suggestive of a high-grade tumor. On the histology, we appreciate the neuropil in the background. Again, it looks like fluffy um, cotton candy, sort of broken apart. And most importantly, we see the entrapped cortical neurons that are surrounded by these pleomorphic tumor cells. And there is significantly um, variable morphology between the tumor cells. Some are really pleomorphic and really hyperchromatic. In other areas, this was more, even more dramatic. And uh, we can see the tumor cells lost almost their entire cytoplasm. We can see the polygonal nuclei molding each other and there is significant hyperchromasia. And this actually is reminiscent of an embryonal tumor or potentially a primitive neuronal tumor that we can consider. When we do our routine set of stains, tumor is negative for IDH mutation, um, but tumor cells lost the ATRX expression suggestive of an ATRX mutation, and they showed diffuse staining with P53 suggestive of a TP53 gene mutation. So with this, 
we have really two options. Are we gonna consider this a glioblastoma IDH wild type WHO grade four because we did not have IDH staining or should we do more? Well, there's actually two points to discuss here. First of all, we are dealing with a young adult, a tumor that's hemispherically located with or without enhancement in this case. Um, it had high grade histology already, but the presence of ATRX and P53 actually should ring a bell and then say, oh wait, should I look for a alternate IDH mutation here? And the answer is yes. So we, we could do IDH one or two sequencing or preferably concurrently, you will you would think about, oh, how about histone mutations? And we have actually a surrogate marker for histone uh, G34R and V mutations. We have mutation specific antibodies. So if it is available in your lab, getting this done is going to potentially be faster than IDH1 and 2 sequencing, but you can also do these concurrently. Uh, so when we do our immunosechemical cocktail that recognizes both of these mutations, we saw the tumor cells were positive, confirming the diagnosis of a diffuse hemispheric astrocytoma H3G34 mutant. And we assigned a grade four for this tumor because it had areas of necrosis, but currently there is no assigned grade for these, although majority of these are high grade tumors. And the other important thing that we can remember about these is uh, that these tumor cells often have patchy GFAP staining and negative olic 2. And so this arm that we already discussed uh, usually covers tumors with high grade histology, uh, although it's not entirely um, restrictive to the histologic grade. How about tumors with low grade histology? Like I already discussed a tumor in the midline, regardless of the low grade histology with the appropriate molecular alteration should be called grade four anyway. So this arm doesn't really change. But if you have a hemispherically located tumor, especially in a young adult that looks low grade, and we couldn't show any of these histone alterations, the thing we should look for is the presence of these molecular alterations, MIB, MIBAL1, FGFR1, FGFR2, or such. And um, if they are present, the tumor sh should be named as diffuse glioma with whichever the alteration is present. And this was the recommendation from C-IMPACT now. Uh, referring to these tumors that often have actually a better prognosis and referring to these as IDH wild type was a, um, in a way, misinformation because IDH wild type has a very negative connotations coming with them. Uh, so if you are dealing with a tumor that fits neither of these groups, and again, it, it, according to this figure, it didn't have any of the histone mutations or, or any of the other alterations that we can classified as tumor four, either none category or here, we need to think about other diagnoses. Now it's going to be a full cycle that we need to consider adult type diffuse gliomas in adolescents, for example, if we are dealing with a, such a case. And again, most importantly, if you are dealing with a low grade tumor that you didn't find any of the alterations associated with a diffuse glioma, we should double check that it is indeed a diffuse glioma and potentially do for ad additional tests to rule out a non-infiltrating glioma. So with this, I'll go back to the uh, discussion about like how do we work up diffuse gliomas? And the important things is to know the patient's age and know the location of the tumor and imaging characteristics because we cannot really afford to um, ignore these informations. And we need to confirm that it is indeed a diffuse glioma before we do go any further and start grading the tumor or classifying the tumor. And we can do immunostochemical stains such as neurofilament uh, to show that it is infiltrating, for example. Um, we need to do some surrogate molecular stains, uh, including IDH1, ATIX, P53, and for the appropriate location and age histone stains and we need to do uh, additional molecular tests. So confirming that it is a diffuse glioma can be difficult and um, that, that's arguably the most important step though. Now I would like to go our slides. So hopefully you already had access to the slide before. 
And uh, this was a 47 year old who presented with a flare hyper intense brain mass and she underwent resection. And we have three small pieces on the slide. And um, going at low power, we can appreciate areas of hypercellularity and slightly decreased cellularity. But even in the areas of lower cellularity, this is more crowded than a normal cortex. And the other thing we should notice is uh, the background. So you can clearly see the neuropil in the background. In addition, we can clearly see occasional entrapped neurons in the background. So with all these features, this is actually suggestive of a diffusely infiltrating glioma. Uh, in other areas, again, it's more obvious in low power if you stick in low or power a little longer, you can see the tumor is actually aggregating, making these like small structures. And when we look closely what those structures may correspond to, we can see a neuron and tumor cells satelliting around the neuron. So this is one of the three secondary structures defined by Scherer, perineuronal uh, satellitosis. The others are tumor may accentuate around the blood vessels and it may accentuate uh, right under the PIA. So those are the features that we look for to recognize something as a diffuse glioma. Uh, if you have very few tumor cells, as you can imagine, this could be harder. Or if you have a lot of tumor cells, it can also get harder that you don't appreciate the neurofill in the background. Uh, so for the second problem, you can do a neurofilament stain and highlight the presence of neurofilament in the background. And if you only have a few tumor cells, you can do stains such as KI67, like in that other example, which will highlight the irregular nuclear borders of tumor cells because we really don't have irregular cells in the brain normally um, present that are proliferating. Or you could do stains such as OLIG2, which will also highlight the same thing. OLIG2 would normally stain only small normal oligodendroglial cells. If you have stains and uh, nuclei that are quite irregular staining with OLIC2, that could be um, a clue. In addition, um, I'd like to point out the mitosis here now that we landed on it. So we will get back to that and use it for grading uh, criteria. Then uh, morpho morphology is still very important, even though we need to do molecular tests to prove our point going forward we still need to pay attention to morphology. And in this case, you can appreciate there is significant monomorphism of tumor cells. They all look alike. And you can see the perinuclear uh, clearing that is called um, Friedeck appearance. That's very uh, typical of oligodendroglioma. So we are thinking morphologically, this tumor is an oligodendroglioma. I happen to found one mitosis in um, in that area, but if we look around, we are not going to reach to the cutoff. And with one mitosis, it's not enough to upgrade this tumor to grade three. And there is no evidence of necrosis or microvascular proliferation. And we still need to do our immunostochemical and molecular workup to show this tumor has IDH mutation and 1P19Q codeletion. But just with the morphology, we can at least favor an oligodendroglioma at this point. And with this, I'd like to stop sharing and go back to uh, the presentation and happy to answer any questions you may have. Wow, yeah, that was fantastic. So at this time, we're going to move into Q&A. You can submit your questions via the chat box or you can unmute to ask a question. To unmute, select the microphone in the lower left corner. Once you've asked your question, please remute to avoid background noise. Well, I'm not hearing any questions. Yeah, I got a question. Can I ask yes. a question? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Go ahead. My question was that I was getting, I seem to have been getting this sentiment from what I've been reading in the literature that uh, the utility of deciding on grade two or three for IDH mutant gliomas was going to uh, was not useful. And so the, the grading of IDH mutant gliomas that were less than four at any rate was not going, was going to be changed maybe in the new WHO. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if anybody here is actually in on these things, but that was the question I had. Uh, is that a question? So yes, it's a, <laughs> it, it is a question. It's a great question, actually. Thank you, Dr. Kohan. Oh, sure. Um, the grading 
like you said, if it is not grade four, and now we have an alternate method to get to grade four, it is still questionable what the value of looking for mitoses and calling them grade two or three. And as of now, WHO, as far as I know, is going to keep grade two and grade three because we do not have any evidence, firm evidence that they don't work or any other method of grading. And so far, no one did additional studies suggesting looking for a different cutoff, for example. So maybe one mitosis is not enough, but maybe four would be enough. So since nothing else uh, substantial has been done uh, since the last WHO, they will keep the grading as is uh, with the caveat that it may not have uh, impact on the patient's real outcome. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to read a, a great question. presentation too. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to read a question from the chat. If K27M is negative and you have lost ME3, what would be your next step? Do other rare H3 mutations count for diffuse midline glioma designation? Also a great question. So you may have noticed that I actually sort of switched instead of saying H3K27M mutant, I started calling it H3K27 altered uh, at some point, but I didn't actually go to the detail of why. Um, so studies show that there are other ways of um, achieving similar results of loss of H3K27 trimethylation, and it's usually through epigenetic mechanisms. And one of that is actually easy HIP overexpression that uh, has the same impact. It causes loss of trimethylation and the tumor seems to be, uh, those tumors behave as aggressive as H3K27M mutant tumors. So we, as far as we know, there is no direct uh, alternate mutation in a different region of the histone gene. Uh, but with that, if you have a tumor that is H3K27M wild type, so you don't have a mutation, but there is loss of trimethylation, uh, those should be classified as H3K27 altered. And one of the methods to test that is you can do an easy HIP immunohistochemical stain to show overexpression, or we may need to do methylation profiling to confirm that they are indeed diffuse midline glioma. Okay, I have another question in the chat. I think it says regarding the midline diffuse glioma, is there any histological key we can use to suggest this diagnosis, especially in a lab that does not have H3K27? Um, well, I think if you have a midline tumor and if you happen to have an ATRX stain, um, that would be one clue. If you have a midline tumor with loss of ATRX and not IDH, that's probably H3K27, but that can only capture about maybe one third of them. So it's not going to be very sensitive. Um, I think it's safe to assume that it will be a diffuse midline glioma and do further testing. So if it's not available in your lab, you can only diagnose this as diffuse glioma, potentially not provide a grade, so not to be misleading and do more testing. I think it is essential to do testing. Okay, and then the, another question, uh, I, I will read another one in the chat group unless someone wants to ask a question directly. Okay. I see one. If someone, if someone would like to ask, please unmute and go ahead. I think I can read one, I see one on the chat. Oh, okay, sure, go ahead. Um, Histologic impressions without accessory molecular stains may lead to wrong grading. And how often we see this kind of experience, um, I think now people already got the hang of the integrated diagnosis, so we don't see them as often, but it is absolutely correct. So if we have a tumor, for example, the most simple example would be if you are dealing with a tumor that looked like an oligodendroglioma, so, but you have like one or two mitoses, and but you cannot show 1P19Q co-deletion. Now, all of a sudden, it is no longer an oligodendroglioma, it's an astrocytoma, right? And then the next step is like Dr. Cohen asked, is it enough to call this a grade three? Well, with the current criteria, it is, if it has my, uh, mitoses. And the next step actually should be doing CDKN2A homozygous deletion. So it is a complicated process. So if you skip the molecular confirmation, uh, you may actually reach out to the wrong uh, grading. That is very possible. 
Same is true for the histone mutant tumors, right? Because histologic grading really has no relevance as long as it is a diffuse midline glioma. So if you cannot show that it has H3K27M mutation, uh, it will change the grading significantly. Okay, any more questions? Oh, I see one more. Uh, how do we deal with relative 1P19Q co-deletion results by fish, like increased control signal resulting in decreased 1P19Q, uh, decreased ratios of 1P and 19Q relative to the central mirrors, but it is not an absolute one to two ratio. So this happens often with tumors when they have anaploidy, right? So we have to have more than two chromosomes for this to happen. And it is often um, a feature of a high-grade glioma, not necessarily an oligodendroglioma. So we have already set cutoffs for this, and we can diagnose these as relative 1P19Q co-deletion, and it technically qualifies for a diagnosis of oligodendroglioma, um, but we look for additional features. Does it have the perfect morphology for oligodendroglioma, or was this a recurrence of a prior oligodendroglioma, which may now have more unemployed introduced to the tumor as they get higher grade. And if there's a red flag, we actually verify this result with a different method um, that can verify the probes that we recognize on fish are indeed recognizing a whole arm deletion rather than just happen to lose the area of that probe. So that will hopefully um, capture those, those cases that some of the relative 1P19Q co-deletions are not real, unfortunately. Uh, what's the turnaround time for molecular testing? It depends which lab you use and how your setup is and how uh, streamlined the ordering process of these tests could be. Um, for a next generation sequencing at UCSF, it's about three weeks. If we order it like today, we will get the result in less than three weeks. Um, can even be two weeks, depending on which day and if there are any weekends um, that are introduced. And it is certainly, it's, it could be faster for some Sanger uh, tests in certain labs. So you can go that route, but that's why we still use the surrogate markers because immunostochemical stains are available often the next day. Thank you everyone for your questions. We are at time. Um, apologies for not getting to all of the questions today. Um, we do want to thank everyone again for joining today's AANP Teaching Rounds presentation. We would ask that you take a few minutes to complete a short evaluation which has been entered into the chat box. Completion helps to ensure accurate reporting for our accreditation board. It may not display as a link, so please copy and paste it if needed. And thank you again to Dr. Pekmaji for an excellent presentation. This concludes the session for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.